good morning and number 294 this morning, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. I'm going to be looking at the temple ready for service today. The temple of Solomon. Number 294. shepherd lead us you know the savior leads you he doesn't he doesn't whip you along does he if you just uh, follow him why well, he's just there to lead you along and so often I think that uh, many pastors and people think that you've got to use the whip to get the sheep you know if you've ever worked with sheep you know that doesn't work <laughs> sheep uh, need to be led and uh, that's what the Lord always refers to us or, or likens us to are the sheep. You no, know, <clears throat> I had one pastor always used to say, you're just a bunch of dumb, dumb sheep. Well, lead us then the way the Lord does, okay? <laughs> That'll be fine. <laughs> we'll just uh, <clears throat> follow after willingly. Okay, number 300. More secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior. You know, there's nobody in the world that's uh, that's more secure in anything than the ones that know Jesus Christ as their Savior. What a wonderful uh, thing to know that is. <clears throat> Number 300. Mm -hmm. 
more secure than no one ever is the loved ones of the Savior, not John Storm, or a burning, or a burning on the sky. God is on the tent and buries in His holy courts they flourish like a Sometimes I think people, believers, wonder if God really cares about them. They wonder if uh, what is happening in their life is really of God and for the glory of God when they're walking with the Lord. And uh, there's no reason to doubt what God's doing. It's all for His glory if He's using you. And so we just need to thank the Lord for that, that He will use people uh, for His glory. And he alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and power, thanksgiving. And so we thank him. Here we are in the thanksgiving season, the middle of November, and uh, thinking about the things. Well, what are you thankful for? Who do you thank? <laughs> you know, everything, like, like somebody uh, <clears throat> did a great deed for us, and, and I wrote and told them, you know, well, I said, you've given us reason to thank God for what you've done, and we appreciate that, that uh, we can do that. It's uh, not the individual, they get their blessing from giving. And so when you receive something, uh, it's uh, they've gotten their blessing, and you should look to the Lord and thank the Lord for what he has given you through these people. <clears throat> uh, Okay, ready for service. Talking about the Solomon's Temple. We've looked at it as David prepared and got things all ready for it. And then King Solomon came in and, and after four years of, of reign, then he set out to build the temple. He had everything prepared. And so Solomon's Temple is in building. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings chapter 7. At the end of that, you see that uh, it says, So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And so that's going to be uh, the end of uh, 1 Kings chapter 7, as we see the temple ready for service. Uh, and then we'll go into the dedication and the actual opening and things of it, um, possibly next week or when we get to 1 Kings 8. So in 1 Kings 7 now, we're looking at Everything is done, it's in prepared, uh, and this is for Solomon's temple. Now, several things to think about was we see many of the uh, utensils and the things that they are using were used in the tabernacle of the wilderness. And so the tabernacle is the first beginning of the temple. It was the temple, the moving temple in the wilderness that God had declared. Uh, so with that one, we see that now a permanent temple is being built, and it's being built where God wanted it to be built, in Jerusalem, on the top of the mount there. 
And there have been, well, see we had Solomon's temple, then we had uh, Ezra's temple when he was released from the captivity and went back and rebuilt the temple. And then we had Herod's temple that was built during Jesus' time. It was in building when Christ was born and uh, of course was used then during his ministry. That was Herod's temple. It was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus when he uh, razed uh, uh, Jerusalem. And so uh, we see that that's, uh, we have those temples and yet we have another temple right now that is in building and waiting for the right time. Uh, they have the utensils already again made just like they mostly did for this temple from the tabernacle, but they had to add more to it because it was going to be a lot bigger type thing. All Israel would come and worship there and get, offer sacrifices. Uh, <clears throat> so we have this, uh, what they call the third temple now that is in ready to be put up in Jerusalem. And that <laughs> temple will be the Antichrist temple where he goes and shows himself that he is in fact an imposter and that uh, they are not worshiping God, they're worshiping a, a man, they're worshiping the devil and they allow him to come in and take charge and the whole world flocks after this Antichrist that shows himself and proclaims that he's God in the middle of the uh, Jacob's uh, Jacob's uh, seven days, there's seven years of tribulation. Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah calls it. And so that's for Israel. Um, this especially has to do with, as we look at the worldview next hour, not for now, but just to give you a background on the temples. And then we also in the scriptures, we see in uh, Ezekiel the millennials, the millennial temple. And then there's going to be a final temple um, in eternity where all the sacrifices, where everything comes together with the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne also. Uh, so we have all these different ones talked about in the Bible. This is Solomon's temple, the first fixed structure in the place that God is calling uh, the center of the world. It's calling it where his throne is gonna be, where Jesus Christ is gonna rule and reign over this world, and what a day that will be when this all takes place. Uh, he will be reigning there. Now the world doesn't know that, but that's what's happening, and we're gathering together all nations now so that they can come together uh, and bring on the Antichrist, and bring on this end times uh, prophecies that are foretold in God's word that have not yet been fulfilled. Uh, let's not get off too far from that. Let's get into 1 Kings 7 and uh, see what this temple was like. And it also goes in, it starts out with uh, Solomon's house, building of his house. We know that the uh, temple in the fourth year, uh, verse 37 of the previous chapter, chapter 6 of 1 Kings says, the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month Ziph, and in the eleventh year uh, in the month Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof and according to all the fashion of it. So it was seven years in building. Uh, that's the temple that... that uh, <clears throat> Solomon's temple is what it's called. So, verse uh, one of chapter seven, but Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he fished, finished all his house. Uh, so that's the second house that's uh, built there. He built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof was 100 cubits. This is the third house that's mentioned and the breadth thereof 50 cubits, and the height thereof 30 cubits, upon four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams upon the pillars. Now cedar's a very good, strong, long-lasting wood. It's uh, full of oil and, and fiber that doesn't break down readily. And so to get, be able to get cedar pillars and cedar uh, beams and things was uh, very long-lasting, a very good choice. And of course, we, we saw that in previous chapters, 
<clears throat> how that all came together. It was covered with cedar above, upon the beams that lay on 45 pillars, 15 in a row. So you have all these pillars, 15 in a row, uh, that lay, that the uh, beams are laid on. <clears throat> this uh, 100 cubits, that's about uh, roughly, uh, what would you say, just by 150 feet, uh, so that'd be a, a standard cubit. There's the, also the long cubit, but roughly that, just to get an idea. Uh, so 150 feet, the breadth there of 50, that'd be about 75 feet. And the height there of 30, be about 45 feet high. And so we see that that's the uh, dimensions of it. And it's on four rows of cedar pillars. So there's four rows of these cedar pillars, and then the beams go on them. And so it was covered with cedar above the beams that lay on 45 pillars, 15 in a row. So there you have the, kind of get a picture in your mind of these rows of pillars and then the beams laid across them uh, for the temple. Now, you don't really see that in this artist's rendition. But you do see the pillars. There's not 15 of them there but uh, in a row. But you do see some of the pillars uh, not mentioned necessarily for uh, Solomon's temple that we see here. And there were windows in three rows, and light was against light in three ranks. And so you had these windows and, and across. You had three of them uh, in rows, or three rows of them, and three ranks. So you had, uh, you know, three ranks, and that'd be nine, and nine windows uh, there along. And all the doors and posts were square with the windows, and light was against light in three ranks. And so everything is laid out just the way it should be. It's square. It's uh, the way it was supposed to be done. Verse 6, he made a porch of pillars. The length thereof was 50 cubits, and again about 75 feet. The breadth thereof 30 cubits, about 45 feet. And the porch was before them and the other pillars, and the thick beam were before them. Then he made a porch for the throne where he might judge, even the porch of judgment and it was covered with cedar from one side of the floor to the other. And so he's got all these little out places around it then that were added on for different purposes. Verse eight, in his house where he dwelt had another court within the porch, which was of the like work. Solomon made also a house for Pharaoh's daughter whom he had taken to wife like unto this uh, porch. Uh, so the uh, the house that he made also had similar uh, construction as this did with the porch. All these were of costly stones, according to the measures of huge stones, sawed with saws within and without, even from the foundation under the coping, and so on the outside toward the great court. Uh, so all these huge stones and it's interesting as a workman myself <laughs> and thinking about what it was like um, 3,000 years ago, uh, here they have huge stones sawed with saws. Uh, I mean, they didn't have big um, you know, steam engines or powerful uh, things with rotary saws that cut, cut stone, did they, that we know of. Uh, they had manpower. But even then, just to have a saw that would withstand the cutting of stone was phenomenal. Uh, even today, you get, we get these hardened stones. We have, uh, I have a, a saw blade that can cut concrete at home on my saw. Uh, it's out of very hardened steel, and I think it has diamond tips on it. But, uh, but what did they have? They, must have had some fantastic uh, works because God showed the workmen how to do it, didn't he? He showed them how to make these things 
And so they were the best that was ever made. Think about that. Uh, we, we wonder about it. We think of, you know, the, the cavemen that the, the evolutionary process talks about and all these kind of things and how nonsensical that is uh, to build a structure like this uh, without even having to make any adjustments after they move them in. Verse 10, and the foundation was of costly stones, even great stones, stones of 10 cubits and stones of 8 cubits. Uh, so there you're looking at about 15 foot across stones. Things, things were squared, it says, but 10, uh, 10 cubits and 8 cubits. So, you know, 12 to 15 foot uh, <clears throat> stones that were cut. Uh, that, that's big. You know, that's, they were, even if the floor would hold them up here, well, it wouldn't hardly hold from step to step. And so you think about the, the size of those stones, think about the weight of those stones, <clears throat> just phenomenal. And yet uh, God showed them how to do this. He laid out the pattern. He gave skills to all the men that, that needed to have the skills and they had the tools and equipment uh, they, as we'll see more, uh, when they make some of the things and when they do the brass work and stuff, they, they laid these in clay and, and put them in molds and stuff. And so they could use that mold over and over again uh, to do these things. It's just phenomenal when you think about that. Uh, so the, uh, the huge stones and cedars, uh, the great court in verse 12 there around about three rows of huge stones and a row of cedar beam both for the inner court of the house of the Lord and for the porch of the house uh, <clears throat> uh, so all this was costly stones it says in verse 10 great stones 10 cubits and 8 cubits uh, verse 13 and King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre he was a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali and was father and his father was a man of Tyre. Uh, so this gives you the tie-in of Hiram. He was actually of the Jewish race, but he was in Tyre where his dad was, had been with his widow. Uh, so Na he was in the tribe of Naphtali. Uh, worker in brass, he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work all works in brass, cunning to work, a skilled worker in bronze. And he, made the, to, and he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. Uh, now I'm sure that he trained people to help him, assistance and things, but he's the mastermind of the brass works. Verse 15, for he cast two pillars of brass, he cast, listen, we talk about casting things today and you ought to see the factories where these big casts are made for pillars. You think about the pillars you see, even the cement structures for highways and bridges and things. Uh, and, and then you think of this, he cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high a piece. So, so there's almost no, 